Welcome to worship for the weekend of November 6th and 7th, 2021. My name is Lindsay Beaulieu, Director of Operations here at First Presbyterian Church in Morganton, North Carolina. We are so glad you're worshiping with us online today. If you're new to FPC, we want to connect and get to know you. So take a few minutes to follow the link at the bottom of your screen to our website and click the button that says connect with us. We would love to meet you and learn how we at FPC can walk alongside you in your faith journey. This week, we continue our stewardship sermon series titled More Than Enough. Recent events in our world have shined light on the scarcity of things that we once took for granted. Being together, gathering for worship, sharing a meal, seeing friends and family, toilet paper. The news is full of stories about scarcity of goods and services. And while these things are very real, the fear of scarcity is not compatible with the kingdom of God. Followers of Jesus are instructed to live with the spiritual practices of abundance and generosity in place. In God's economy, there is always more than enough. Enough to love, give, know, and live. Today, we hear an account from Mark chapter 12, where a poor widow gives everything she has to God. Jesus teaches us that it's not honor or money that draws us near to God, but when we give Jesus everything we've got, we see the kingdom of God at work in our world. I pray that you'll be blessed by the message today. Later in the service, we will be celebrating the sacraments of the Lord's Supper. So I invite you to gather your elements in preparation for keeping the feast with us. Also today, we recognize our veterans. Thank you for your faithful service. On behalf of a grateful nation, may God continue to bless you and your families and this country which you served with honor. Church, let's be called into worship using the words of Psalm 146. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Let us pray. Blessed indeed are those who place their trust in you, O God, our sure rock and refuge. Guard us from giving to any other the allegiance that belongs only to you. Shine upon us with the brightness of your light that we may love you with a pure heart and praise you forever through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Friends, our first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8-16. through 16. Hear the word of God. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God is near to those who call upon him. God wants to draw us near even when we are broken in our sin. If we humble ourselves, repent, and confess our sin, God is merciful and just to forgive. And so, you and I, we are invited to confess our sin together using the prayer on the screen, followed by a brief moment of silence for your personal reflection and prayers. And so trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together. Let us pray. God of glory, you sent Jesus to be the light of the world, to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us from our sin and pour out the gifts of your Spirit that, forgiven and renewed, we may show forth your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ. So God, hear now the prayers that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. In the dry and desert land, God nourishes the ground with rivers of life. And so hear the good news. Because of what God has done through Jesus Christ, I can declare with full confidence that your sins as well as mine are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And since we have been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Church, as we consider generosity this season of stewardship, I'm reminded of your faithful giving to FPC, and I'm thankful for how you generously support the work of our staff, our beautiful facility, and God's mission at work here at FPC Morganton. Thank you for being a part of the continuing God's work in our community, not just with your finances, but with your time, your talents, and your leadership. Presbyterians believe that good stewardship is about far more than money, and yet how we use the financial resources entrusted to our care really matters. Members of our congregation carefully and prayerfully make an annual financial pledge to fund the work of the church as an act of worship. Each year we consider how God might be calling us to give generously with gladness and with joy-filled hearts. 
Members of FPC Morganton are receiving their annual stewardship booklets and pledge cards in the mail this week. And next Sunday, November 14th, we will make our annual pledge contribution as an act of worship during our weekend services. As a new member of FPC, my family and I are praying about our contribution for 2022. It is an honor to be included in God's story of care and provision for this church. If you're not a member of FPC Morganton, please know there is no obligation or pressure for you to give. We are happy you're here. Yet yeah, it's an important part of our commitment to being God's church together for Morganton, for Burke County, and beyond and making a financial commitment to support the work of the church in the upcoming year is a crucial part of that. So what we do ask for is your prayers. Prayers as we make these important decisions in the days and the weeks ahead. Thank you. Come before God with gifts and offerings that reflect your joy and gratitude for God's grace and goodness. Come before God with praise and worship, joining with all the saints as we present to God with gladness a portion of all that God has entrusted us to steward. Let us pray. Lord, you have blessed the work of our hands, given us resources and talents to share in your service, and entrusted us with gifts to share for the building up of your kingdom. We rejoice that you enlist us to participate in your provincial care for all creation. We celebrate the work of your spirit in us and in our world, and through these gifts, we give to you in faith and hope. Bless and use them in ways we may never see, but can nonetheless trust. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Friends, our news feeds today are filled with supply chain issues, a scarcity of goods and services, labor shortages, and shipping delays. Medical supplies, computer chips and semiconductors, ships themselves, shipping containers, truck drivers, groceries, good workers all seem to be in short supply. And so the question being asked and the concern shared by many of us is some version of this, will there be enough? For Presbyterians, we believe stewardship is about way more than our finances. It's about being good stewards of all that God has given us. Yes, our money, but also our community, our faith, our time, our relationships, and even our planet. The fear of scarcity is simply not compatible with the kingdom of God. Followers of Jesus are instructed to live with the spiritual practices of abundance and generosity well in place. While it may be difficult to see, and it may look very, very different than what we had hoped. In God's economy, there is always more than enough. And so today we'll hear Jesus teaching his disciples about a poor widow who gives a small amount of money that makes a huge impact. And so friends, before we dive in, let's pray together and ask God to be our teacher. And so God, would you be our teacher today? Allow us to see the light and truth of your word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make us more like Jesus and allow us to showcase his love to everyone we meet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our scripture passage comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. Hear the word of God. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, 
all she had to live on. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the past few chapters, Mark has shown Jesus in conflict with the Jewish leaders of the day, particularly the chief priests, scribes, and teachers of the law. They are shown as attempting to undermine his teachings, catch him in controversy, and discredit his ministry. At the same time, Jesus shows positive examples of faithfulness in the midst of this conflict, such as the scribe who sought the greatest commandment and the widow we encounter today. One of the criticisms Jesus levies at the religious establishment most often is their treatment of the poor. He sees the system as severely flawed. Its original intent has been clouded. It's an adventure in missing the point now. In our passage for today, Mark shows Jesus seated opposite the temple treasury. And from this vantage point, Jesus can see all of the, sh- all of the comings and goings, all the activity of the day. He can see the system at work. With this in mind, Jesus sees what he believes to be a, tra- a tragedy, uh, a travesty of justice and uncommon faithfulness. He begins teaching his disciples about what discipleship actually looks like. This teaching occurs in a small group with Jesus speaking directly to his disciples. Rather than a teaching for the masses with large crowds gathered, it's a private conversation between Jesus and his followers, the contents of which we as readers of Mark's gospel are now privy. Jesus sees the priests moving about in their long robes and offering long-winded prayers to show off their piety in the temple treasury. In my mind's eye, I see many bringing their offerings forward, dropping in large amounts of coins so that they all clink and clang against one another, drawing attention as the coinage pours out. And these gifts are what keep the temple running. They go to a good cause, or at least that's what people hope. And yet, Jesus has another opinion. He sees the temple as flawed. More importantly, he sees its leaders as flawed. Jesus calls out their flashy dress, their flattering prayers, and their rules that devour widows' houses, just like the widow we meet in Mark 12. Unlike the religious leaders who seek prominence in their first seats, followers of Jesus are called to give up their position and privilege, to move from the front to the back of the line, to intentionally give others the prime spot. Unlike the religious leaders who Jesus says devour widows' houses by demanding offerings to the temple treasury, followers of Jesus are called to be open-handed, generously striving to meet the needs of those within their congregation and community, and to do so with joy. You don't need me to tell you that these pandemic months have been harder on some than others. During these past months, our church has seen a dramatic increase in the needs of its members physical and mental health issues, cancer diagnoses, COVID-19, isolation, indebtedness, loss of income, and even death. We have received and responded to more requests this year than I can remember in years past. And praise be to God, through your generosity, we've been able to respond to a few in ways that I wish we could have responded to everyone. Our mission and outreach committee has given gifts that have kept other organizations running in order to serve even more people who might be struggling in our community. But friends, these examples that I've given are just a few that we know about. Far more of us and those in our community are suffering in silence. Maybe we're just intensely private with personal matters, or maybe we have too much pride Perhaps we don't want to be a burden to others by asking for help when we assume that so many others need it too. Perhaps more than we do. Maybe we forget about the support system that we have in this congregation altogether. And frankly, friends, I'm included in that number too. Whatever the reason might be, I'm keenly aware that you and I only know but a fraction of what people have endured and are currently enduring at any given moment. All I'm saying is this. Everyone has a story. We never know what other people are going through. We will never fully know and appreciate each other's story, the challenges we face, the hardships we endure, the very real hurt we all carry around with us. This woman that Jesus observes in the temple, she had a story too. We are told that she's a widow. She'd lost her husband somewhere along the way. 
And at this time in human history, women didn't enjoy the same freedoms that are established now. She's incredibly vulnerable. Even if her husband's estate was well established, it was still tenuous at best. Her husband's family would be responsible for protecting and keeping her financial well-being secure. And so, from the context of Mark's Gospel, whatever has happened, whatever misfortune has befallen her after her husband's death, this woman's story now includes poverty. The widow's gift to the temple treasury that day was equivalent to seven-tenths of a denarius, which was the daily wage of an unskilled worker. It's literally all she has left. And yet, here she is. She shows up for worship and gives what little she has left to the work of God in the temple. Ted Wardlow, president of Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, writes this, Here is a woman who, in the midst of all the things that are not quite right, chooses nonetheless to give and be faithful to a vision of something bigger than what she can now see. Despite the tragedy of her situation, she continues to give out of obedience to God. She continues to support the work of God through the temple. She continues to focus on and be grateful for what she does have rather than what she doesn't. And because of her devotion, she had more than enough to give. And her generosity catches Jesus' attention. Jesus sees her faithfulness. Jesus tells his disciples that while many other people gave large sums of money because they could afford it, this poor widow gave more because she gave all she had. He wants his disciples to know that giving out of abundance is much easier than giving sacrificially. From his vantage point, her gift was much more significant than all the others combined. And from that day forward, her story is synonymous with generosity and what it means to give sacrificially to God. You know, this reminds me to be very careful. We have to beware not to reduce those we deem as less fortunate to objects of our well-intentioned charity. If we're not careful, we can strip them of their dignity and humanity. It is often the case that those we consider less fortunate than ourselves, just like this poor widow, have so much to teach us about living a life of faith and trust. The wholehearted trust of this poor widow is exactly the kind of response that Jesus demands from his followers. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, people respond in one of three ways. They are astonished and amazed, they are openly hostile, or trusting that Jesus is who he says he is, they drop everything and follow Jesus. Reading Mark's Gospel and thinking about discipleship, the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross by Isaac Watts comes to mind. I love this line, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. To me, this seems to be a fitting summary of what Mark is trying to convey. Time and again in Mark's gospel, the takeaway is that Jesus requires our all. Following Jesus demands all that we have, our, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And this sort of sacrifice is exemplified by a widow's two copper coins. Ted Wardlow asks these questions of pastors, but I think they apply to all of us. He says this, what does it mean to give your whole life for people who, for all of your trouble, may not even notice what you've done? What does it mean to care enough about an institution, however humid it is, that you stubbornly decide not to abandon it and instead dedicate yourself to a vision of what it might be at its best, rather than what it is at its worst? Tough questions. But my prayer is that you and I might envision this church and this community at its best. That we might commit together to supporting God's work here. And that we might be reminded that despite the challenges we face, that we have more than enough to give. Friends, as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we are reminded of God's generosity. God withheld nothing from us, not even Jesus, who sacrificed himself for the redemption and reconciliation of the whole world. At this table, there is no favoritism. Old and young, rich and poor, those in their Sunday best and those in their worst rags, saints and sinners, it's a table for everyone. This is not my table or yours. 
It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not even First Presbyterian Church of Morganton's table. This table belongs to the Lord. And everyone who is in need of a Savior whose name is Jesus is welcome at this table to be fed and nourished in your faith. And so, my friends, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray together. God, you revealed your love by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be the light of the world. He came to be your living word, to baptize us with spirit and fire, to feed the hungry, humble the mighty, and to announce the good news of your coming kingdom. With thanks and praise, we offer ourselves to you. We share in this holy meal and remember that in your body and blood, we find and declare the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, your bread and this cup, your covenant people, Christ's body and blood given in love for the world. Make us one in the Spirit, one in the church, and one with Christ our Lord. Make us more like you and give us the strength to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And we pray all these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I trust that you have a table of some kind, and bread, and a cup in front of you. Because Jesus himself invites us to this feast, these common and ordinary elements have been set apart for the extraordinary purpose of God's grace, which nourishes us in our faith today. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to take the elements together, use the pause button between them to serve yourself and others who may be with you. When you're ready, push play, and I'll be right here waiting for you. In this way, we'll receive the Lord's Supper together today. And so friends, I receive from the Lord what I pass along to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so friends, I invite you to remember and believe that this is the body of Christ that is broken for you. Take and eat. And friends, I invite you to remember and believe that this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, you have gathered us at your table, called us your beloved and fed us from your body and, uh, and blood. Transform us to be your body in the world and empower us by your spirit so that we may serve you and our neighbors with great joy. Amen. And so friends, may you be inspired by the poor widow's sacrificial gift. May you be grateful for God's incredible generosity towards you today. 
And in grateful response, may you be convinced that there is more than enough to give. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine brightly upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 